find out how they got there and see maybe if there's any secret sauce or what mistakes did they made that I could avoid or what things did they do that accelerated their growth. And, and that's really what birthed this idea and kind of the whole notion of like road to wine expert. And Welcome back to the Road to Wine Expert podcast. Today's episode of Road to Wine Expert is going to be a little different. First, let me introduce myself. I am Talia Goodman, the podcast manager for the Road to Wine Expert podcast. I work alongside Brian to deliver you fresh wine content each week. For this episode, I got to flip the script and ask Brian questions about his journey to becoming the wine expert he is. From working at a wine shop to completing the first three levels of the WSET, Brian worked his way through the wine industry and has a boatload of experience and knowledge to prove it. Keep listening to hear how Brian left teaching and a steady job behind to follow his passion for wine. This is great. This is a great question. I had a lot of time to think about this one. So thank you. Um, You know, I think asking this question, so let me, this will be great. So rather than answer your question, let me tell you a little bit about the impact of asking this question to a bunch of people. So once you sit down with 33 plus people, because now I sort of ask this it's like my party trick. It's my icebreaker for a lot of people in the wine industry. And as you hear more and more people's answers, you begin to think of your own. And there are so many little moments that add up to the actual big one that I don't know if it was one such thing so much as it was the snowball of events that happened around the same time. And so... In a short order of things, I was disappointed in my nine to five, really just not having a great time and looking for a way out, something. I had a wonderful friend and mentor at that same job who took me to this amazing wine shop called Vin Chicago. And I went, look at this selection. This is amazing. There's wonderful, affordable wines. Uh, and a lot of Spanish wines, which reminded me of my time abroad when I was studying in Spain. And I went, oh, it's taking me back, giving me this wine memory. So I'm unhappy that, and then I read this article by Cal Fussman. So Cal Fussman was a guest on this podcast, and uh, I heard his interview on Tim Ferriss, and he briefly mentions becoming a sommelier and working at Windows in the World. And so all of these things are sort of floating around my head at the same time. And this sort of epiphany happens and it's difficult to say which one is the actual push. Uh, But right around the same time I applied for that wine job, I read the article, I did all these sort of wine things. I was reading wine at lunch and that was sort of the, like, let's get serious about that. And within a very short time frame from then on, I really just went head over heels into the wine industry. So that's really the short answer, but I could dive in and dissect any of those if you so desire. Absolutely. We'll dissect all of them. <laughs> okay. So I think that when, it seems like when it, your interest in wine started was when you were abroad in Spain. I mean, that's probably the first time I tasted actual wine as opposed to whatever served at wine night at the local college bar, which was, I'm not sure if it was two buck chuck, but it was something on par or worse than that. I mean, I think a bottle of wine was three or $4 and these bars were making a profit. So that just goes to show you the quality of what you're drinking. You could get a bottle of Andre sparkling wine or champagne. I believe it is even on the label. Uh, that was, I think, $5. So that's when you were really upgrading to have yourself a fancy night. Uh, So prior to Spain, that was my 
intro into wine. My parents had it on the table. We're not one of these European families where wine was a part of every meal. Wine was certainly around at holidays, and I sort of knew it as celebratory, but I didn't necessarily equate it to food and everything else I do now. And that was mainly Spain. So it was a cultural shift where I went, this is everywhere and it tastes good and it's inexpensive still. Um, and that was really a big, a big moment. It sort of planted the seeds for becoming a foodie, getting into wine, discovering that sort of sensory palate stuff that I have. So did you kind of realize your interest in wine when you came back from Spain? Or was it something that you were aware of while you were abroad? So, I mean, I liked it. It was cool. And I didn't really know anything about it. And frankly, I could argue, I still don't know very much about it. But I just, there was something about it that was always fascinating. I think one of the things I hit on when I interviewed Chappie was we talked about we got a little deep and we were talking about alcoholism and wine history and sort of the obsession with you know booze and spirits and i remember being a very young man and having martini books and being very into drink and i mean i was 13 12 or 13 years old so and i had not had alcohol at that point so i don't know there's Maybe it's always been in my blood. It's crazy. Um, so going forward, yeah, I think it's just these the snowball effect. Spain certainly had an impact on me. And then coming back, I was more open to trying new things and researching things and discovering new things in terms of both food and wine. And I saw it as, I think I went from a consumption mode of food and drink to more of a experiential mode, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is like, do you remember the moment when you like read Cal's article and what that was like? Because it seemed to have a really big impact on you, but why, what was this, what stood out to you so much about it? Well, there's a lot of things. First of all, the story the Cal's experience becoming sommelier for one night at Windows on the World is a story within a story. And there's this other story of someone coming to terms with September 11th and writing this article with all of the experience that they had and around it. And I think what makes Cal's piece so incredible is that he finds inspiration again in this moment where he connects back to his experience as sommelier, where he tastes that wine and, and all of a sudden it awakens his senses. And that's one of those things where you're like, wow, this is a special thing. Wine is really special in that regard. Cause I don't know, it would have to be something else that's very sensory, right? That would trigger you back to that memory. And then from there get the, willpower and desire to finish the article um so so it, there's that level of, of how wine is so poetic and beautiful and then there's just the actual act of him learning wine in a very short period of time which is incredible and i i envied that i said well, well if he can do it and he's just a regular guy then certainly anyone else can so uh I think it, I think it was really twofold. It was it was his actual act of becoming sommelier, and then the article itself is really incredible. So I think those two coming together just really planted that seed of you should go do this if you if that's what your heart and mind are telling you to do. And that article came to you while you were working your nine to five job. Yeah, it landed on my desk. So I was very much into Tim Ferriss at the time. I. I picked up a copy of the four hour body on someone's shelf. I said, Oh, this is interesting. And started reading it. And then it sat on my shelf for a long time. And I went through a, a really rough breakup. 
and I open the book. And in the book, there's a thing called the slow carb diet. And it's just about, you know, essentially eat these eight to 12 things, I think it is, and you'll lose weight. I said, well, that sounds great. Uh, I'd like to be, I'd like to look better. Um, I got to get back on the scene and meet some new people. So I should probably look my best. And yeah, I followed his gospel. I end up losing 45 pounds in a matter of eight to 10 weeks. It was crazy, rapid, insane fat loss. Um, so that, so I'm, I'm immediately, you know, praying at the altar of Tim Ferriss somewhat daily. And then he's got his podcast comes out, um, and, and gains popularity. And so I, I sought him out there and he has lots of amazing guests. And then Cal came on and, and Cal's episodes incredible. He tells all these amazing stories and in cocktails before the class is almost a footnote in this like crazy. It's a, I think the podcast is two hours. Or something. It's just incredible. And Cal takes you on all these journeys. I was like, wow, that guy's cool. I'm going to go read that article. And, and that's really how I stumbled upon it. So uh, just, again, this, these, all these things sort of coming together. I mean, like I end up at Cal's article, not even because I'm sort of into wine, but just because I was fascinated by who Cal Fussman was. Yeah. It also is interesting how you kind of lost all that weight and then you read this article by Cal and it kind of all just sparked a new beginning for you like a breakup with your girlfriend like it really seemed like wine this was the time when you started on a new path for clean wine and all of these things coming together whoa i i guess you're right i mean i don't i didn't really see it as that way but absolutely i think it is very much a rebirth of like who I was, how I was going to find myself, uh, all these different things sort of coming. And, and maybe that's why, um, maybe that's why it's so hard to pinpoint because all of these things are so closely connected and it's not like I had this aha moment where I drank some amazing wine. I said, Oh yeah. Um, you know, it, it was once I was into wine that I started to drink amazing bottles that only made me fall more in love whereas I didn't have this experience early on where some people do where they're, they're at a party or they go somewhere and they're, they're just like, ah, I've got to do this. Um, so it was more of this evolution. You're right. And I was sort of at this like tipping point and it just so happened that, you know, I fell into one. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't just one moment, but a bunch of things working together. So, Tell me a little bit about how you ended up at Vin Chicago. Great. So I went there with Kurt and he was my coworker friend. I don't know if I mentioned my name earlier, but yes, Kurt uh, was my mentor and uh, the person who ultimately took me to Vin Chicago for the first time. And I thought it was really cool. There was a store up in the suburbs near where I was working. And then there was a store downtown in Chicago. And so I'd gone to both locations and I thought the people are really nice. The atmosphere is great. They've got a lot of good wine. The church bells are ringing. If only that was earlier. Um, <laughs> the, so they have a lot of good wine. And I was like, this would be cool. This would be a fun part-time job, something to do on the side. And I, I just looked back at the email preparation for this interview and I send the email in April saying, Hey, Vin Chicago, we could put up the whole email on the site. And I didn't hear back till August. So I, I had this dream of like doing this part-time thing, you know, maybe working four hours on the weekend. And it never came through. And I didn't even follow up. I just thought, oh, yeah, they're not going to hire me. I don't know anything about wine. So I sort of put it on the back of my mind uh, in that time frame. So I apply, unhappy at work, still unhappy, quit my job, start freelancing. So then come August, I get this email out of the blue. 
hey, are you still interested in working in Chicago? And of course I was. So that's that's how I got there. And then I had to get through the interview, which is a, a whole separate story. Let's hear it. Okay. So hilariously enough, I get this interview and I'm super nervous because what do I know about wine? And so prior to my interview, I thought, wow, I should really know some stuff. What can I do? So there's another Tim Ferriss podcast guest and another guest of this podcast, Richard Betts, who wrote the Scratch and Sniff Guide to Wine, which is an excellent book for anyone beginning. And it sort of outlines the foundation of what everyone needs to learn. Like a lot of wine knowledge stems from this book, and that's what makes it so great. So I read that book. I haven't brought it with me in my backpack. And kind of to use it as a reference or, you know, hey, have you ever talked about this? Have you read this book or something? And I could just at least speak to its greatness and then maybe weave the story in about how I listened to the podcast with Richard Betts. And um, anyway, so that was my my prep, plus a little light reading on the side. I, you know, read articles and everything else. And I felt decent going in the interview. And I get to this point where I'm interviewing with Pete. And he says, what kind of wine do you like to drink? Which was just such a trap in a, in a great way because he really forced me to talk about wine rather than like really get into it, right? There's no hiding what wine you're drinking. So I had just been to a restaurant in Chicago called Boca. And I don't know if it's still true, but at the time their wine list was primarily focused on wines from the Loire Valley. So I knew the Loire Valley. I knew the Loire Valley was in France because they had a map, I believe, in the menu at the time. So I had that nugget in my head. And, and they kind of showed where in the Loire Valley these wine, particular wines were from. It was, it was really well done, looking back on it now. Uh, and by osmosis, I gained all this wine knowledge. And so I had a great glass of Chenin Blanc there. And I said, yeah, I've been really into Chenin Blanc. And like around the same time. I had a great glass there, and then I would go try other Chenin Blanc around the city or by the glass. First saw by the glass, I would get it and try it. So I said Chenin Blanc. And his response to me was, the dry, do you like the dry or the off-dry style? And I had no clue what to say to that. Just totally befuddled. And I sat there and... I, I mean, fully admit it, just lied through my teeth. I just picked one and went with it because you're you know, in the interview hot seat. And I said, off dry? And he responded in kind and said, oh, Vouvre? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> and he took great pity on me and realized that I was over my skis and was at least I could at least name a grape, so I think I earned some points for that. But then my lack of knowledge about Chenin Blanc sort of threw me. I threw myself under the bus in that regard. So, uh, But then he explained to me the, you know, different styles, other stuff I might like, things that I should try, you know, other wines I should seek out. And then even said, you know, here's a couple of wines that we have in inventory that I think you would like. So that itself was really great. I think another fun anecdote from that was he asked me on a scale of 1 to 10 what my wine knowledge was. And I think I was pretty harsh on myself. And I think I said... Well, I think I prefaced it before answering and asked, you know, what's 0, what's 10? You know, and so in my head, I'm thinking 5 is like the average person. And so I, I believe the time I gave myself either a 4 or a 6... I'm not sure where. I, I think I decided on six. And they said, but I'm a quick study and I could really learn a lot. And looking back, I was, I mean, off dry and dry. I'm, I'm a one at best in that category. But I had some confidence, so that was great. Um, but they hired me, so go figure. It really seems like you did have confidence throughout all of this. Like the ability to leave your job and go on a different path and then like you're going into this interview and 
gosh. Where do you think that came from? Well, let's not confuse confidence with insanity because they're similar. <laughs> yeah, they they are. I, I mean, people thought I was nuts to leave my job, and people couldn't see the long play. And I knew that I'd found something in wine that was going to serve me for a very long time that other other things would not. So, in terms of confidence, I don't know. That's a great question. Where it really stems from, I think. I think part of it was that I got lucky and I had a lot of great experiences. I had a lot of key mentors. I had a lot of dumb luck of picking bottles out from retailers that didn't suck. Uh, you know, like grabbing a bottle of wine and people saying it was good. And it sort of reinforced this idea of, that I was good at something when the reality is, is I had no skill. Like if you look at, there's no correlation to grabbing a bottle of wine from the liquor store and having people enjoy it. But it sort of created this false sense of security. And that's probably why I rated myself a six in that interview. But I don't know. I just, life's too short not to go after what you like to settle, right? Like you go after what you want. And so ultimately I wanted wine and I wanted freedom from the nine to five corporate gig. And I looked at wine as a place that could provide that in some way. And when I worked at a wine shop, I was so happy. When I worked at Vint, I was so happy. It was like the first time in a while. I can remember being, like being happy going to work, which is a very scary thing. So the confidence fake it till you make it, I guess, is sort of where that comes from. But, I, I mean, there's probably, we could really go deep and unpack some stuff about why why I have this, right. uh, this fake confidence. But I think, that, truth be told, it was really, it was really a lot of luck. And I think people discount luck a lot of times when they're talking about their story. But I have perspective now, and I've talked to enough people about their own stories. And I think, uh, you know, maybe I'm too far on the extreme and overvalue luck, but I got very lucky. So talk a little bit more about your experience at Ben and what you got, what you were exposed to while working there. Ben was really wine education on steroids. I had a lot of mentors. I had a lot of people with industry experience, retail experience, just working at the shop part-time for a couple of years experience. So it really became this amazing space to learn and to try stuff. And trying was really incredible because we did a tasting every month at the store and we'd open 30 wines. So we'd have six tables sorry, five tables, six wines. And as employees, we would host the event. We would pour for our clients, customers, and we would also taste the wines as we went around. So we could get a sense of what was in the store and what we were selling and what was what we liked and what we didn't like. And I mean, in short order, you're tasting a minimum 30 wines every month. And for me, that was awesome and i think if you work at a restaurant or had i worked at a smaller wine shop that didn't afford me those opportunities i would have never been able to like compact that experience um, in such a short period of time i mean to think about that within four months i tasted over 100 wines which is crazy plus there would be you know, samples that would come back from manager meetings we would have events we had tastings every Sunday, or excuse me, tastings every Saturday uh, in the store. So those would be the wines we had featured already in the month, plus other things. So quickly, I quickly gained a ton of uh, knowledge on wine. And, and there, there's no substituting for tasting. So that was, that was huge. And then just the 
you know, osmosis of being around other people who really like wine. And there were several mics that were there and, uh, they really helped me a lot and talked a lot about wine. So in terms of both tasting and mentors, hard to be the education that I got there. And I think because it happened so fast and because I was so eager, it sort of fueled my fire and just made me want more and just want to learn more and continue down that path. So it seems like that was really the start of your wine education. Um, so did that kind of spark your interest in getting more wine education and seeking that out? Absolutely. I think once I set foot in the store the first day and really then realized within 10 minutes of walking the floor, no longer as a customer, but as an employee, like how I didn't know anything about regions, about varieties, about um, prices, about margin. I mean, anything about the wine industry was all new to me, but also really exciting. So I knew I had to get better and I don't like being bad at anything. So I knew I needed some sort of formalized training or some structure. You know, I thought books could only get you so far. So I, I signed up for a one day seminar, which was WSET level one. And I think a lot of people end up skipping one and going to two, which is fine. But one sort of served again in the same thing as whether it's luck or whether it's positive reinforcement that I got into that classroom setting and I suddenly realized like, Oh, I actually know more than I'm giving myself credit for. Like, you know, a pretty good amount and you've learned a ton about wine just by being around wine. And it, it was again, that affirmation, you're doing the right thing. And I've learned a ton in that class. And I said, okay, so if this is one, what does two look like? What does three look like? What does this trajectory look like of wine education? And it ultimately put me on the path. Again, I want to say around the same time. And shoot, this sort of goes back to your earlier question. But I'm definitely going to be in this camp of people who was absolutely 100% influenced by the Psalm movies. And when you see the Psalm documentary, and the the test which all of these candidates go through, uh, you can't help but be, I don't know, you've got admiration for all of the knowledge they have. You hear the conversations and it sounds essentially like a foreign language. And I don't know, I, there, there's something really attractive to me about that. So that certainly inspired me and I knew that there was another system of education out there. So while I sat for WSET level one, intro SOM I knew was sort of out of my league to begin with. And I wanted to start with the basic of the basic. So um, I went there. But, but that was dangling in the back of my head, right? Like I knew that there was a path in which you could become a master sommelier um, thanks to that movie. So I'm certainly part of the SOM generation, if you will, of these people who have entered the wine world, having their experience with those movies and being like, oh, yeah, I want to do this. So There you go. So you went on to take the WSET 2 and 3. Yes, I've taken both. And you took the intro to sommelier exam as well. I did take that one as well. So I took WSET level 2 and the intro SOM. Uh, in short order, I think they were about two weeks apart. Uh, after level one, I'll have to pull up the timing on this, but I'm fairly certain that I took, well, I took level one the week of the Chicago Marathon, because I remember it was Sunday, and it was relatively easy to get to uh, the Merchandise Mart, which is sort of hard to do um, on a given day in Chicago. I was like, this is odd. And I'm like, oh, I'm like the marathon. You know? um, and it was just desolate down there because everyone was like out watching uh, the race so that was October and then I mean within weeks of that time frame I signed up for level two in the intro song and thanks to another podcast guest um, Hillary Zio 
I read her book and she recommended taking WSET 2 and the intro psalm at the same time because of their overlap in curriculum. So I went, okay, I'm going to double down. I'm going to do both. And so I have a very hard time doing anything over a long period of time. So I kind of looked at the system and I gave myself six weeks to study and pass both. So I put it on short order and just really went for it. And it worked out in my favor. I mean, I did have to travel from Chicago to Orlando for the uh, intro Psalm course, but it was pretty, it was pretty incredible. And that felt like a big win. That felt like a big validation that I was doing the right thing again, that taking these tests and getting certified was another pat on the back. Like, Oh, you're doing the right thing. And this is a way to get recognition for the time and effort you're putting in. And so uh, ultimately then I went on to take three just because I don't want to displace someone who is in the industry and is working the floor and I would hate to take their spot is sort of how I feel about that. Whereas, I mean, it, and because of the Psalm movies and everything else, it's become such a demand. I mean, I remember going to intro Psalm in Orlando and there was, I mean, in this conference like hall space, of what had to be like 75 to 100 people it was huge. There was 10, 15 people who were not in the wine industry. The guy next to me was like some kind of scientist and was just there for fun. And I was like, hey, buddy. I got some bad news for you. This is not going to be a fun, like, learn about wine for the weekend. It's super intense. So that was really interesting to see people who were just doing it for kicks, which I, you know, immediately I'm like, well, that's cool that this is out there for them. But at the same time, um, you know, seeing other people in that room, especially in Orlando where there's all of these hospitality jobs, right? And people are working at restaurants and resorts and, and like, looking to level up. And, you know, I kind of, I guess I had one experience there where, so for those of you who don't know how this works, when you, so the introductory sommelier course and exam is a two day event. You sprint essentially through all the major wine producing regions in the world. I was lucky enough to have four master sommeliers run through uh, the gauntlet of all the different places. And so you're bouncing around lecture to lecture, you know, you're doing France in you know, the different sections in like a matter of hours. And you're just doing this crash course almost as review. Like if you haven't studied here, there's zero chance you're going to, anything's going to stick. And so you go through this thing and then at the end of Sunday or day two, uh, it was Sunday in my case, you take a multiple choice test and so afterwards, you they you take a break and then they let you know who passed and who didn't. And I would say a good majority of people pass. And, and the people who were sitting around me for the two days, several of us passed. And, you know, there's a little sparkling wine and some high-fiving. And there was a guy behind me who didn't pass. And I just remember, I guess I'll never forget like the look of devastation on his face. And I just thought, like I always now have that sympathy built in for anyone who's taking the test and in the industry. And I think about how people don't get into advanced or they're waitlisted. I just would hate to do that to someone else because I wanted the certification. So in a sense, Early on, I needed the validation, and I think it was really important for my early wine career. And now, you know, I go to take WSET 3, which I took recently, and, you know, that's sort of more in line with the knowledge I need to know in my current job and what I want to do long term. So, uh, but that's to say, I don't know if I'll take four. I don't know if I'll do a diploma. 
and it's just it's been a, it's been an interesting ride with education and I don't really have a, a right answer what what I did I don't know if I'd recommend it for everybody let's put it that way do you feel that your background in education led you to that path or helped you oh helped me a hundred percent so not only did I graduate college with a teaching degree, uh, I graduated college in 2008. So the job market, not great. Um, and a lot of people who lost their jobs but had certificates were back in teaching. And it was like, ooh, hire an adult or hire someone fresh out of school. Pay them the same. Both teach kids. Will you choose life experience? So jobs were few and far between. Um, for new teachers, and uh, I had to kind of scrape it around to get by, and I worked a bunch of different jobs and part-time jobs, but one of the jobs I got was an ACT tutor that I did after school, and so in that job, not only did I get good at the ACT, I got really good at understanding standardized testing and how to be a good test taker and how to beat multiple choice exams. So both WSET 1 and 2, and then also the introductory sommelier exam are all multiple choice. So going in, I have a huge advantage as a result. And I think when I, when I did it in six weeks, I did so knowing like how someone would write a test and prepare a syllabus and do all this. I mean, I had a bunch of inside intel on like how a teacher or teachers think and that gave me a huge leg up because I could look at the syllabus and see the weighting of different subjects and realize like where you should spend your time like oh uh, they talk about France a lot you should probably spend a ton of time on France and they don't really talk about Australia so maybe you can skim those chapters um, and it really allowed me to focus I would say in hindsight I didn't necessarily get the most well-rounded wine education as a result but I did, uh, I was able to pass and, and get through it because of that educational background. Absolutely. Do you feel like that education is necessary to become a wine expert? So my answer initially is yes, but... <laughs> Or yes and, right? Um, I'll say yes, but it doesn't need to be formalized education. There's many different ways to be educated, and I think a hybrid, both formal and informal, so working in a wine shop, being surrounded by people, tasting wine, there's no substitute for that. And unfortunately, any classroom, curriculum, book, can't do that and that's sort of where they miss the mark you know there's always this component as you get further into wine where you're tasting with people who know wine better than you who know wine sort of on the same level as you and you're always in these groups and and there's no comparison for that so you have to have both um, but I think having structure especially from someone from the outside is really important because it sort of tells you these are the things you should know these are the most important things that are out there or you know I think if you're just learning wine and you just said I, I want to learn about wine and I don't really care how or what uh, it's totally fine and you can do that but a huge part of learning is having context to sort of hang new facts on and so if you look at something like wine law and, a, and like how law dictates what grapes can grow where, it's kind of a weird concept. But if you learn about wine laws in France and where they're developed and how they developed, at first you're like, what? And then you sort of realize this is an archetype. This is a, there's a longstanding history here that, you know, 
other countries model their system off of France. And so that makes it easier to learn these other rules and everything else um, about how wine is made and in what ways. You can certainly gain that knowledge by like drinking and tasting, but there's, there's something to be said for having some formalized structure and going through stuff. And if you look at all the great wine textbooks or all the great wine classes and instruction, the same patterns are repeating over and over again. So there is a blueprint out there for like how to do it the right way. Uh, it's not the right way for everyone, but there's something to be said for that formalized structure, whether it be through a book or a classroom setting. What's really cool about this podcast is you are able to hear about um, all the people that you're interviewing have different paths um, through wine education and have taken that opportunity in different ways. And I guess that leads a little bit to where did this podcast come from? Like, what was the inspiration behind it? So it was a hundred percent selfish in that I really wanted to know what was out there. I also wanted to know if there was a way to get there faster. You know, I was hungry for more. And again, we talked a lot about like feeding the fire, getting lucky, all of these things. So, you know, once I passed WSCT level two and the intro psalm, I was feeling pretty good about myself. And then I said, well, yeah, now what? Like, what's next? What's out there? And, you know, I thought about it and I started looking and seeing, you know, what other wine jobs are available? You know, what else could I do? You know, in my, in the own, it at VIN, for example, I could have stayed and went from part-time to full-time and went from, you know, full-time retail associate to assistant manager to manager. Uh, and I saw that path and I saw the people that were doing it. And what I loved about wine was working the floor, connecting with people and getting them a bottle that they felt happy about purchasing. And on the rare occasion, they would come back in and say, Hey, that was great. Thanks so much. And so those are the moments that are really special. And I saw my manager who, you know, from my perspective was oftentimes like in the back, so working on ordering wine, doing a very important function of the retail world. Uh, not glamorous, uh, but super important. And I, I said to myself, I don't really want to be back in the grind. Like I got out of this nine to five working at a computer all day to be in wine. So I had to kind of know what else was out there. And I thought, well, why not just ask the people who you've admired and look up to at this point and find out how they got there and see maybe if there's any secret sauce or what mistakes do they made that I could avoid or what things did they do that accelerated their growth. And, and that's really what birthed this idea and kind of the whole notion of like road to wine expert. And if that's ultimately where I wanted to see myself, which I think is fitting because I'm a total know-it-all um, and wine has just taught me how little I actually know. So it's been very humbling and, and much needed for me, but I, there, there's two parts. One part is this feat that seems impossible. Like being a wine expert to someone from the outside seems just like total insanity. You know, how could you ever know like what all there is to know about wine? And so the truth is you can't, right? And debunking this myth that you need to be an expert to enjoy wine. So it's sort of twofold. Uh, and then just to understand like, all these people's different choices that they made, growing followings, you know, writing books, having their own podcast. And I don't know. So I operate by this principle and it's very simple. And it is, if you drink wine, you are my friend, right? Like if someone is that like finds another wine drinker, you immediately have something in common. Like you've self-identified as 
a little bit crazy because you're way more into a beverage than anyone should be. But there you are. And so you always have this commonality and you can always learn something from someone else who drinks wine uh, at any level, whether they're, they're sort of, you know, at your same educational level or not. You know, there's, there's all, there's always something you can extract from that exchange. And, and that's really, you know, I think maybe that wasn't quite the idea that was there when the podcast started, but something I've considered in the space between the summit and now, and as I'm looking to do season two and three and 17 and, and whatever this turns into is ultimately that notion of exchange between people who love wine. So interviewing all these people, what have you learned? Oh, man. There's so many lessons. I mean, we could probably just, you could probably just roll down the list of names and I could say all the different things that each person taught me. Um, but globally and as a whole, um, one of the most important skills I learned was listening. And it's just really funny when when you're interested in what someone has to say because I, I'm sitting there right and you have to remember when I'm doing the summit I like want to know exactly how these people did exactly what they've done and I'm really focused and I'm looking for an answer right and I'm trying to find something so as I'm having this conversation my brain is going in two directions one of which is I've got to keep this interview going and I've got I like I got to keep them on the line and keep them talking and then also I've got to find this answer. Like I gotta, I gotta, I gotta know. Um, and in doing so, it's not like a normal conversation, right? It, it is really about actively listening and hearing what they're saying and thinking about it while they're talking and, and then planning your next step, which is really a fun thing to do because you, you remove yourself from the conversation and, and that's, and that's the other side lesson here, but you, you really focus on that person and it just changes your relationship. If you become a better listener, um, your life sort of improves because you actually start hearing what people are saying instead of waiting for your turn to talk. Um, but the other lesson there, which I was going with was just, you know, that notion of losing your sense of self putting someone else in front of you um, and, and just realizing that what I have to say doesn't really matter, except on this episode where I happen to be your guest. So I get to talk, I get to let it all fly <laughs> finally. So I've been pent up, but the reality is that you are sort of insignificant and like to humble yourself and to, to think about other people. So I guess the great, story out of all of this is what began as a selfish act becomes completely unselfish in the end because it's about other people. Um, and then just, I think the other thing that I really learned that's really important is just how wonderful and kind all these people in the wine industry are and in the hospitality industry and just have this connection with wine that they're just all inherently good people. I mean, here are people who have already given me a lot They've either given me some type of inspiration and they've given me some path to studying or a book or an article. They've, you know, created a podcast that I admire. You know, there, there's all of these factors and little old me reaches out and says, hey, uh, that's my impression of me a few years ago. Uh, hey, do you want to be uh, my my guest on in the summit that I'm really excited about. And I mean, everyone you heard said yes, but I mean, an overwhelmingly amount of people said yes. And people who I never even thought would respond to my emails did and said no because of schedules or whatever, but still were there and still answered the call. And that was pretty cool to see that people care that much. And, and that's really what this industry is about is like lifting other people up. If people are identifying as wine people, like you bring them in and you help them out. So that those are the big lessons. 
that it seems like there's a really strong community um, in the wine world and people are really keeping an eye out for each other, which is great and supportive. So if you could interview anyone, who would you interview? Great question. Um, I So there's a handful of people that are obvious wine people, but I'm going to go back to where we started. And I'm going to pick Tim Ferriss because um, I think that interview would have the sentiment and the heart that an interview with Cal did and like Hillary, but, but she's so friendly, right? And, and so kind. And I, I don't know, it's weird. I had this deference to Cal because, you know, at the time I, I, I pinned him as the person to be transformative and I still feel the same way about Tim Ferriss or a very similar way. So I think it, w- it would be him for the reasons mentioned earlier, like the losing the weight, the writing the books, all of those things, and to kind of find out how he did stuff. I think what's really amazing about him is he doesn't do a lot of interviews also. I mean, he's he's someone who sits sort of like me on the one side of the mic and, and, and extracts knowledge from other people. Um, so it would be cool to sit down and interview him and kind of say thank you and, and talk through some of the stuff that he's done and he's achieved. And I think as a fan of his work and someone who's really passionate about the stuff I did, I think it would bring a different perspective to any of the other interviews he does currently, which seem to be more of people who he's peers with than someone who's like a fan. For, yeah. For lack of a better word, idolizes him. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. We're going to switch gears. Okay. What is your Mount Rushmore of grapes? Oh, okay. So, man, so this is fun. So a little teaser is this is a follow-up question. I've started asking uh, all these people who've come back to re-release their episode. So um, and kind of gathering some new intel. It's something we, we, we touch on in the past, but also I really like this idea of Mount Rushmore of anything. Uh, I learned it from a, a separate podcast uh, called Pardon My Take, and they do Mount Rushmore as of varying degrees. So I thought this was an appropriate thing. And, and like picking four is better than sort of picking one. Like you, can, you get this variety, but, but you're still stuck with four. So it, it cuts it off at a good point. Anyways, enough about Mount Rushmore's in general. Let's talk about my Mount Rushmore since you asked. So number one, for obvious reasons, is going to have to be Shannon Block, mainly because it was one that, it's very cornerstone to my career, made me look foolish, but is now something I really enjoy. I mean, Sauvignier, uh, Bouvray, there's you know Shannon from South Africa, and it's one of those grapes that's like very fluid, and it's like how it can express itself in both styles that are dry or off dry, uh, and it has a lot of complexity for a white. And it's something, you know, it's a little bit like of a heady kind of, um, like you think about it and it's not something you necessarily just like pound down, although you, some of them you can. So it's, it's good in that regard too. But it's one of those, like if I get a good to great glass of Chandon Blanc, I'm usually like very much inside my head. And it's a different kind of experience and you're, and you're getting all these different flavors and aromas and, and things are sort of bouncing around. And so when they're like at their peak, they have such a great sort of, you know, floral quality. And then you get like either, you know, lanolin or sheep's wool, and like honeycomb, like, I mean, it can go all over the place. So there's such a spectrum and, uh, that's really cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that one up there. Uh, I'll stick with whites and say Chardonnay, which is a total cop out. But I mean, for obvious reasons, Chardonnay is awesome. It's, you know, it's really great. You know, as much as drinking awesome, expensive Burgundy um, is, it's really wonderful when you find really great expressions of Chardonnay. Um, like I love Chablis. Chablis was one of those first wines that really did it for me. Um, and I think other places 
still make great Chardonnay. Like one of my favorite Chardonnays is uh, Ridge Montebello Chardonnay. I think it's just epic. I got to go taste out there and I had that. Um, so that, that always holds a special place in my heart. Uh, so there's a lot of styles and things that I, I really like and appreciate with Chardonnay. Okay, so I got two more. Um, I'm going to put Syrah as my next one. And Syrah, similar to Shannon, has a, a range of styles. And when it's great, it's mind-blowing. It sucks. It just rips your heart out. So there's always a gamble in that, and I sort of like that. Like you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. So I'm into I'm into Shiraz or Syrah for that reason. Uh, I'll take all of them, both uh, alternative spellings. And the last one, you know what? I'm sticking up for this grape because it gets a bad rap, and it was one that really changed my life, and that's Zinfandel. And I know people are like, oh, Zinfandel. But you know what? I'm, I'm sticking up for Zinfandel. It deserves some, some credit. And it can be really, really cool. I mean, the, I always liked Zinfandel when I was a young whippersnapper and trying it because it's, you know, jammy and it's got, um, you know, loads of grapefruit. And, you know, like when you're thinking of like these California sort of, cheaper inexpensive Zinfandels like they're just like you know you're drinking wine and it's red um but I remember having a wine by Bedrock as a producer it was the 2013 uh Monteroso Zinfandel and I at the time didn't know what Monteroso was that was a vineyard uh and it has to be you know happens to be one of the older um if not uh among the oldest vineyards in the United States and they have these really old vines Zinfandel there which is really cool and Monterosso uh, is just this cool place and uh, the wines are really expressive and I remember the wine had just this electricity to it and this vibrancy that I had not I was like oh I didn't know Zinfandel could taste this good I kind of remember Zinfandel being you know jammy and like not great. And this just had this like racing acidity, this really fun balance. And, uh, it was awesome. Uh, it, I mean, it ultimately took me to Sonoma, to bedrock to taste, uh, at their new tasting room last summer. And that was a special experience, but, uh, yeah, Zinfandel, I have a ton of it in my collection. I, hunt down Monteroso now just because I'm so curious as to what the older ones taste like. So yeah, I'm putting the flag in for Zinfandel. It deserves its place on the Mount Rushmore. And it's like the most American grape, even though it's not from here. So like I'll go full on nationalism and, and pick it for that reason too. Good. Do it. Have your <laughs> confidence in your choices. It's the theme of the <laughs> podcast. Great. Confidence. <laughs> So what are your goals? What do you see the future looking like for you in your career in wine, at Domain, or for the podcast? Yeah. What's next? What's, well, immediately next will be the next episode. I don't know. And that's sort of where I, I'm, I'm focused right now. Uh, but specifically my wine career, I mean, short-term and long-term, Domain is really cool. Uh, we do a bunch of amazing things here. Um, for wine collectors, uh, and that's really special, and I plan to be here for a very long time. So, you know, to continue to grow the company and continue to help uh, wine lovers and wine collectors everywhere, it's really, I mean, it's a no-brainer. It goes back to you know, what I was talking about, this inherent. If you drink wine, you are my friend. So I, I got a bunch of new friends by working here, all of our clients, uh, whether they like it or not, they're my friend. And, um, furthermore for this podcast, it's going to continue to grow and evolve. And I hope to continue to show diversity in the industry to highlight winemakers, and wine educators, and wine writers and podcasters and influencers and everyone else, because this industry is becoming so diverse and it's changing every day. 
and it's great. And there's more and more people whose stories need to be heard. Uh, and I want to be a platform for that. And, you know, ultimately, I hope that one person listens to this podcast and you know, changes their life. And they don't necessarily have to come work for Domain or come join the wine world. But, I don't know, maybe they have a Maybe they always wanted to be a basket weaver or something, and they go do it, right? Uh, that would be really cool. So that's that's my goal long term is to just you know make a change in one person and who listens to this, and that would be that would be enough. So what do you want to tell your listeners? First of all, thank you. It's really cool that you're out there on the other side of this. Uh, I don't get to see it. I mean, I get the interaction on Instagram, but creating a podcast is inherently passive, right? Like you put it out there. You just don't know. I mean, I see people are listening or subscribing. So that's really cool. Um, so thank you for listening and subscribing. And if I'm going to ask you to do anything, it's just to, to reach out for help, whether it be me or to contact one of our guests, you know, all of them end with a way to get in touch and, I mean, if you want in to the wine industry, like we're here for you. And I would love to help someone find their next gig or contemplate their next move. I mean, right after the summit, I had a lot of great interaction with people about what they wanted to do in the wine industry or would this be a good idea. It's just nice to have a sounding board because some, sometimes you think you're in this thing alone. Even though there is this great sense of community, sometimes you just get on your little wine island and so it's really important to just go out there, connect, and, and like further your wine career. So if you need help, I'm here. And if you're too afraid to ask me, there's hundreds of other, pe other people who will help you. And all of your contact information is on the website. That's right. Or if you're so inclined, while well, this helicopter makes one more turn, I'm going to get it into that. If you're interested in getting in touch with me, <laughs> Instagram. Facebook. I mean, this is about as much of a sign as we need to wrap up as ever, but uh, people can find me. Your information is out there. It's there. It is accessible. It's there, yeah, but it's uh, Brian at RoadToWineExpert.com. No. I'll do it. Send me an email. Okay. Brian's story shows there is no straight path to working in the wine industry. All it takes is a spark of passion. If you want to hear from more inspiring wine experts, check in every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new podcast. For more updates, you can follow us on Instagram at Road to Wine Expert or subscribe to our email list through our website, roadtowineexpert.com. Obviously, I want to thank Brian for letting me interview him and motivating me to keep on releasing great content. And of course, thanks to all of our other guests for being a part of this project. Thanks to Domain for sponsoring this episode of Road to Wine Expert. You can go to DomainStorage.com. That's D-O-M-A-I-N-E-S-T-O-R-A-G-E.com to learn more about the services and products they offer for all your wine storage needs. Another thank you to all the musicians who allowed us to use their work in our podcast. To learn more about these artists, go to our website, roadtowineexpert.com slash music. Also, please feel free to leave a review on our website or any other platform of your choice. As always, you can reach out to Brian at brian at roadtowineexpert.com if you have any comments, questions, or concerns. Tune in on Friday for another episode of Road to Wine Expert.